On this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, be part of the group as they take note of and talk about something that, other than God and people, the Bible mentions more than any other living thing. One appears on the first pages of Genesis in the first Psalm. You might say there's one on the first page of the New Testament and on the last page of Revelation. Sure seems like basically every significant theological event in the Bible is marked by a tree. And so in this edition of the podcast, Daniel Ryan Day is going to lead some conversations with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Rasul Berry titled, What's With All the Trees? Trees are a big part of the Bible. In fact, the word trees shows up around 200 times. So what is with all the trees in the Bible? <laughs> you're going to tell us. <laughs> Let's find out together. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from our Daily Bread Ministries, where we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And in this study, that walk is going to be somewhat of a nature walk that we hope will come to mind next time you're in a place where you can you know, smell the fragrance of a pine forest on a summer day, or when you're hearing the soft rustle of red and orange and yellow leaves as they drift to the ground in a stand of hardwoods. Next time you reach up and pluck a piece of ripe fruit from a tree and take a bite, yeah, trees are a wonderful part of God's creation. And over the course of the next hour or so, I think Daniel will help us to see that trees are also a crucial part of how the story of the Bible is told. So that as we read, wherever we see a tree or a branch or a bush or a root or some kind of fruit on the page, we'll look for God. And maybe we'll notice the trees in our world a little more. And when we see them, they'll point us to God. So let's get started. Daniel begins by asking Elisa and Bill and Rasul this question. I'm going to guess this question is not something you were expecting as the beginning of a Discover the Word conversation. So just bear with me. <laughs> What's your favorite tree? Okay, behind Johnny Kramer's house on Walnut <laughs> Street, where I grew, there was a big tree that we built a tree house fort in, Ooh. and that's the coolest tree ever. Do you know Sweet. what kind of tree it was, or is I it didn't just care. the it, tree? It, it was the a tree house yeah. tree. It had the right. right branches and the right places to support a killer tree house. That was that's awesome. That's the one I remember. Yeah, I'm from Philly. <laughs> I don't really think much about trees, but. There was this time where I traveled to Savannah, Georgia, mm. and I saw these glorious weeping willows oh, all throughout the city, yeah. old mm -hmm. and just mm. towering, and I was really moved by seeing those. Yeah, those are gorgeous. Yeah. And I have a list. I'm from Colorado, so I've got to say Aspen. They're mm. amazing, and they're connected, all of them, underground. I love willows. I love evergreens. Oh, mm -hmm. they're so pretty because they become Christmas trees. They're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I love dogwood, even though I'm not from the South. Virginia, that's the state oh. flower <laughs> and tree. They're spectacular. <laughs> yeah. For me, I think if I had to choose one, and this is hard for me, but I would probably choose the maple tree. Mm. for two reasons. One is because... You're part Canadian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do tap maple trees mm, in sure. early spring for maple what syrup. What is tap? Uh, it means you hook up a little straw-like thing to oh, the tree. Okay. And you take the sap out of the tree and you boil it down and make maple syrup. So that's pretty fun. Yeah, it was fun. And then maple trees are also some of the most glorious trees in the fall. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of different colors yeah. and especially the red maples mm -hmm. and the big leaves and all that. Well, you guys are talking about specific kinds of trees and I was talking about a specific tree. So <laughs> if there's a specific kind of tree, for me, it'd be a spruce tree mm. just because that was the kind that dad always got for Christmas when I was a kid. And nice. so a spruce tree just reminds me of Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought Christmas tree might be one of the ones that showed up as we were talking about different favorite kinds of trees. And, you know, I'm one of those people that comes alive in the forest. I love just sitting in the woods, especially if there's like moving water or something in the woods as well. My favorite times of year are 
spring when the leaves start coming out for the first time, and then in the fall when they change colors and fall, mm. and uh, even raking the leaves and playing with the kids in the leaves. I just I love fall too. <laughs> um, uh, a few years ago, I actually. This is going to be a weird phrase to say, fell in love with trees more <laughs> <laughs> because I read a book that had been recommended to me called The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wallabin. And it was an incredible book. You know that verse in the scriptures that talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God? After reading that book, I was like, there should be a new verse <laughs> added. <laughs> the, the trees declare the mm, glory of God because mm. just reading how complicated trees are and how they communicate with mm. one another. And it was just, it was awesome. Wow. And what's interesting is, and maybe this is what set me up to notice this, trees are a big part of the Bible too. Oh. In fact, the word trees shows up around 200 times wow. in the Bible. Huh. And so I, I kind of had this question of, okay, are trees just scenery, right? Because the Bible's full of stories. So maybe they're just telling us, oh, there was a tree here or something like that. Or does the story of trees in the Bible help tell the story of the mm. Bible? Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do in this conversation is I just want to read a whole lot of verses, because I think this is what's going to help maybe sell all of us on the idea that I think trees are doing more than just being scenery in the Bible. And then in the remaining conversations of the series, we'll dive in deeper to what these trees might be symbolizing or how they're helping tell the story. Okay. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're going to start with a pretty famous passage, Genesis two sixteen through 17. Would you read that for us? Russell? Sure. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will die. All right. Genesis 18, 1. Bill, you got that? Yep. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. <laughs> All right. Elisa, Genesis twenty one thirty three. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And I'll grab this next one. This is Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 21 through 22. You shall not plant any tree as a sacred pole beside the altar that you make for the Lord your God, nor shall you set up a stone pillar, things that the Lord your God hates. Rasul, what about Judges 9, 8 through 15? The trees once went out to anoint a king over themselves. So they said to the olive tree, reign over us. The olive tree answered them, Shall I stop producing my rich oil by which gods and mortals are honored and go to sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree answered them, Shall I stop producing my sweetness and delicious fruit and go to sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I stop producing my wine that cheers gods and mortals and go to sway over the trees? So all the trees said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in good faith you are anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. <laughs> Can we just laugh for a minute? That wow. is a what is going great on? Great little yeah. parable. I'm <laughs> like, I don't believe what I'm reading right now. <laughs> it sounds right. like an Aesop's fairy tale mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. right. All right, let's keep going. So, Elisa, 1 Kings 19, verses 4, and just stop right after the beginning of verse 5. But he, Elijah, himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. So the broom tree showing up a couple of times mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. All right, Bill, Psalm 1-3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of waters, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. I'm going to run through a few quick ones here. Psalm 52-8, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. Psalm 92, 12, the righteous flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Proverbs 15, 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Isaiah 11, 1, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. 
Jeremiah 1.11, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Rasul, Ezekiel 17.24. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree. I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. All right, Bill, Daniel 4, verses 10 through 12. Upon my bed, this is what I saw. There was a tree at the center of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew great and strong. Its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it provided food for all. The animals of the field found shade under it. The birds of the air nested in its branches, and from it all living beings were fed. Hmm. Elisa, let's go into the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will know them by their fruits. This is John 1, verses 48 through 50. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. Acts 5 verse 30. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. Romans eleven seventeen through 18. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the rich root of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember that it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. Elisa, Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Revelation 2, verse 7. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. And then our last one, Revelation 22, 1 through 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of of the nations. So what is with all the trees <laughs> in the I'm Bible? hoping you're going to tell us. <laughs> Let's find out <laughs> together. In the book, The Hidden Life of Trees, that I mentioned last time by Peter Wallabin, he tells a story of noticing some moss-covered stones in the forest he worked in, because he's been a forester for a long time, works in the forest. So he decided to examine these, and he pulled the moss back to discover tree bark instead of rocks. So he thought that these were rocks, but it ended up being tree bark. And it was the wood of an old beech tree. What's interesting, at least to people like Peter and me, um, is that (laughs) beech trees typically decompose quickly, but this wood was rock hard. And so he took out a pocket knife and carved into it and discovered there was still green in this wood. And green is the result of chlorophyll, which is what makes leaves green as well. And so this was a living tree trunk And as he stepped back and looked at this circle of rocks, he realized it was in like this perfect circle. And so the middle of this trunk Mm. had completely gone away and decomposed, but the outside of it was still alive. And so he was like, what is the deal here? This tree had probably been felled at least 500 years before this point. So how has it been alive this long? Yeah. So what he discovered is that the beech trees around this old trunk were actually keeping this trunk alive. Mm -hmm. They were feeding it. And over time, what scientists have discovered is that a lot of trees actually underneath the ground their roots will meet Mm -hmm. and they'll take care of each other. They'll Mm. pass food to each other. They'll pass messages to each other. Isn't that sweet? It's crazy. (laughs) It's all blowing my mind right now. (laughs) That's That's all I can say. Yeah, and what's cool about that is when we look in a forest, especially an ancient forest, 
oftentimes we see these individual trees and we assume they're just kind of, you know, struggling for survival or fighting for their space in the woods or whatever. But underneath the ground, they're much more connected than we ever thought. And I thought that was a really good picture for what we kind of explored in our last conversation because we read all these tree verses Mm -hmm. in the Bible Mm -hmm. and there's more going on under the surface than we might realize. And I think one of the best examples of that actually is the tree of life. And so we're going to kind of look at the tree of life in the Bible and see how that tells the story of the Bible. To do that, we need to turn to Genesis chapter two, verses four through nine, because that's where the tree shows up for the first time. And so uh, let's read that together and we can just go around and read it. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right. So what are the three types of trees that we see right here? Food. Yep. Good and evil. Mm -hmm. Tree of life. Tree of life. So let's just touch down on the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then we're going to move on to the tree of life. The next mention of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which some scholars have actually started calling the tree of wisdom, which I think is an interesting Hmm. way to think about that tree. But in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, what does that say? Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded him, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. All right, so we had those three groups of trees. Mm Mm-hmm. You may freely eat of all the other trees, but not this one tree, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is pretty interesting because right here at the beginning, we see God's provision for his people, right? He's providing food for them through trees. And so trees are this symbol of provision of God's blessing of God taking care of these kids that he's just made, right? And he's providing for them. But that also kind of makes me at least wonder the question, did they eat from the tree of life before they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because there's only one tree that God says they can't eat from, which is the tree of the knowledge Mm -hmm. of good and evil. We don't know, but it's Mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. What is the role that the tree of wisdom and knowledge, what is the role that that tree is playing? It's the danger zone. Up to this point, everything is very good, but there's something about this one tree and the fruit that it produces that symbolizes danger separation from God and ultimately death. Yeah. I think of it as a test, you know, the value in God's sovereignty to say, okay, this is Mm -hmm. going to be a test to see if you are faithful, if you trust me. Yep. Mm. And of course, what happens? They don't trust them. They they fail the test. They fail the test, right? Yep. So God's provided all these things to eat and enjoy, to find sustenance, his provision for them. But they, like us, want that fruit from that tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it leads to death. And that brings us to this interesting tree of life that is also in the garden. Let's look at the next time that the tree of life gets mentioned. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim with a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Yes, we have some consequences here of the fact that they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What is God doing here? Well, he's protecting them from being eternally locked into this place of failure. Mm -hmm. Because if they eat of the tree of life, 
then they'll forever be in this condition. And one of the interesting bits, you know, they say the Bible gives us everything we need to know, but not necessarily (laughs) everything we would like to know. Mm -hmm. What I would like to know is how long did they hold out before they finally disobeyed? I mean, did they do it like in the first hour? Or were they there for decades before (laughs) finally they said, well, let's give that other tree a try. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm sick of having apples, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What really jumps out to me about this story is we often think about consequences and a phrase like God drove them out from the garden as this like wrathful God. He's angry and responding out of anger. But what I think we see right here at the very beginning of the story is this glimpse of God's protection Mm -hmm. and his mercy that somehow driving them out of the garden is actually protecting them. Mm -hmm. I had a prof in Bible college who at least once every week said, even God's acts of judgment are ultimately acts of mercy. Mm. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm, That is. But the tree of life, the story with the tree of life in the Bible doesn't end here. So let's switch all the way. We're going to have to turn a bunch of pages in our Bibles, go all the way to the last book of the Bible, (laughs) (laughs) Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, if somebody could read that for us. Revelation 2, verse 7, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Ooh, Hmm. we lose access as Mm -hmm. humanity. End of the story, we're getting access to the tree of life. Let's read Revelation 22, verses 1 through 2. Rasul, you got that for us? Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Ooh, so that's a whole nother layer. Think about how beautiful that is, right? So it's not just an invitation for individuals to eat from the tree of life, but what? The nations. Nations. Yeah, Yeah, this feels like an enhanced version Mm -hmm. of what we see in the beginning. And so here at the beginning, God drives out Adam and Eve so that they don't experience the consequences of their sin. But that's leading to the end of the story where they're going to be invited. All of us will be invited to eat from the tree of life. The question is, how do we bridge those two trees? Remember, we talked at the beginning about how trees are connected. And we're not going to see the phrase, the tree of life in this verse, but I think this is the tree of life in a different way. Mm. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, but becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Acts also mentions Jesus being hung on a tree. And throughout history, the whole history of the church, the cross has been referred to as the tree of life. And so I think just starting with this one tree, the tree of life, or maybe it's multiple trees, I don't know, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. this one tree with the tree of life, we see how the roots of the story of the Bible are connected underground. Mm -hmm. We see how the roots of the tree of life and the garden lead to the tree of life, the cross, which leads to ultimate Mm -hmm. healing and reconciliation, not just for us, but for all nations. I think there's a good chance you may come away from this series convinced that it's not just, as Daniel said yesterday, not just the heavens that declare the glory of God, but the trees declare the glory of God as well. Well, the tree of life, that significant tree that is such an important part of how the story of the Bible is told. You're listening to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And this week, we're asking a question, what's with all the trees? And we're discovering the significant role that trees play in the bigger story the Bible is telling. Well, we are approaching the time of year up here in the Northern Hemisphere when this may be a significant statistic for you. If you have oak trees in your yard, did you know that a mature oak tree generally will drop an average of 700,000 leaves at the end of the growing season. Yeah, each oak tree, 700,000 leaves. Get out the rake. Well, in the next segment of our conversations called uh, What's With All the Trees, they're going to focus on the oak. What is it about the oak tree that makes it an often used image in Scripture? That's what we'll discover, but after we take this short break. 
Well, as we study the subject of trees together this week, I want to point you to another resource from Our Daily Bread Ministries, and it is an insightful video that features Dr. Jack Beck called The Tree God Intends Us to Be. Now, if you're a regular part of our study group here on Discover the Word, then you're likely familiar with Jack. He's been with us at the table a number of times as our geography expert, helping us to look at the scriptures through that lens to see some of the amazing ways place impacts what the Bible is saying. And this fairly short video that is actually one of our Our Daily Bread daily video devotionals is a really good one. Check out The Tree God Intends Us to Be with Jack Beck when you search for it on our Our Daily Bread YouTube channel. And that may introduce you to more of what Our Daily Bread Ministries has to offer there on our Our Daily Bread YouTube channel. And now let's listen as Daniel begins this next segment with a uh, quick tutorial of some key facts about the mighty oak. Oak trees are known as symbols of strength. They're also known for their ability to stand against adversity, so like strong winds, things like that. They're known for long life. They thrive often in open spaces where they can get a lot of sunlight. They can survive in rough and exposed conditions. So if you've ever heard of like the shaggy oak, it'll be in a place where there's a lot of wind, a lot of Mm. rocks, not as much soil. They can be very frugal with their resources in that way. And those may only grow to 15 feet tall. So we have this big expanse difference, 15 to 100 feet tall. Mm. They can also live for a long time, like 500 years, um, which is really interesting. And for oak trees, often a sign of distress. And if you've ever walked in a forest with oak trees, you might have seen this before. A sign of distress, especially for an oak tree, is to try to sprout little limbs and leaves at the bottom of the tree, at the very bottom of the trunk near the ground. And this is a super desperate move for an oak because they are not great at effectively taking light and converting it into energy. And those leaves hardly get any light because they're at the bottom of the tree. Mm. But it's one of the ways that it like desperately tries to survive when it's threatened by other trees. So in contrast to that, a healthy oak tree who's at peace spends its energy growing upward and extending its limbs as far as it can to really just soak in the sun. And so they'll put their crown up as high as possible. And when they do, they can live for over 500 years, which is pretty crazy. And oak trees are mentioned quite a bit in the Bible. (laughs) So let's read where they show up in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 18. And they're going to show up at the end. So listen for the word oaks. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, raise your eyes now and look northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Rise up, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Hmm. So we have the oaks there. Now, what's the context for this passage? This is when Abram and Lot are separating. Yeah. And why did they separate? They had a little fight. Yeah. Yeah. Their (laughs) herdsmen in particular were fighting for space because the herds were getting bigger and bigger. And who chooses where to live? Well, Abram gives Lot the first choice, which is a very gracious thing. Very. Uh, As the senior member of this firm, he could have taken the best land for himself, but he lets Lot pick the best land. Yeah, he lets Lot choose. And in a way, you could say maybe he's even trusting God in that way of, you know what, I'm going to let Lot choose and we'll see what happens for me. He ends up at the Oaks of Mamre after he kind of gets this tour of the promised land to an extent of God showing up after he's given Lot first choice of the best land. God shows up and gives him a tour and says, hey, I've been making these promises to you, right? We're at chapter 13. So God's already showed up in the story a little bit with Abraham. I'm making these promises to you. Everything you see is going to be for you and your offspring. And your offspring, there's going to be a lot of them, (laughs) like the dust. And then he ends up at the Oaks of Mamre and builds an altar. I think it's really interesting that it's the oaks, which seems to speak of a cluster of trees. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been to Israel, 
you don't see much of that. I mean, they don't grow many trees in Israel. They grow a lot of rocks. They don't <laughs> grow many trees. There are rocks everywhere. Hmm. But to see a cluster of trees, that would kind of be an ideal place because it would be one of the few places where you'd have some protection from weather. That's and a good stuff. insight. Yep, yeah, that's it. And that was one of the symbolic things of trees throughout the Bible is that they're symbols of God's, not just his provision, but also his protection. Yeah. That he protects his people because it protects them from the sun, protects them from the wind. Because of the climate, as you mentioned, these oaks maybe are 20 to 25 feet tall. We don't know for sure, obviously. But what's fascinating is if we look at like Hosea chapter 4, verse 13, for example, we're going to find out that places like the Oaks of Mamre, where there's this cluster of trees, as you mentioned, Bill, are often places of worship. Okay, Hosea 4.13, they sacrifice on the tops of mountains and make offerings upon the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth because their shade is good. Because their shade is good. <laughs> Very practical. Um, yeah, and then there's one more theologically loaded term here, which is the place Hebron. And we've had Jack Beck on here before, our Bible geographer, and he loves to talk about how important places are when yeah. they're mentioned. What is kind of the theological loaded, symbolic nature of Hebron. Well, Hebron becomes a place where David first becomes king Mm -hmm. over Judah. And then ultimately, when he captures Jerusalem, he becomes king and the northern tribes come and join and it becomes the nation of Israel. Yep. The word Hebron means friend. Abraham's often called the friend of God. It's also near the cave of Machpelah, which was the grave of Sarah, which was really the first land owned by Abraham as a fulfillment of God's promise. Because remember, the king wants to just give Abraham that land, and he says, no, I'm going to buy this. And so it's this like deposit or down payment on the promise of God. And so all of that is kind of loaded in this term, Hebron. So we have these oaks of Mamre. They're a symbol of worship. They're a symbol of God's protection. They're a symbol of God keeping his promises. They're also a place that God shows up later. Could somebody read Genesis 18 verse 1 for us? And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. What happens in Genesis 18 where God shows up here under these oaks? Well, that's where God promises Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a son and Sarah's not really buying it, mm-hmm. but um, <laughs> this is where God comes and specifically says, okay, things are going to start happening now. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. promised that before, and yep. to this point, nothing's happened. Now it's kind of like he's underlining the promise and saying, no, we're really going on there now. Yeah. And this is where we start to see a theme emerge throughout the scriptures. We see this with Elijah later and other places where this idea of God meeting people under the tree Mm -hmm. Um, Elijah's under a broom tree in his story. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Here, Abraham's under these oaks of Mamre. Mm. And so God meets people under trees, which is kind of fun. Again, here we see oaks as a symbol of worship, of protection, of God keeping his promises. Let's look at Psalm 29, verse 9, and we're going to see oaks used kind of in a little bit different of a way. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, I'll say glory. Yeah, Psalm 29 is this story of worship to God and specifically of ascribing to God the glory that's due his name. It often describes his might and his strength in this psalm. And so the oaks here again are tied to worship, this worship of recognizing who God is, how strong he is, and how he provides. Another place they show up is in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. Bill, would you read that for us? For you shall be ashamed of the oaks in which you delighted, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. Hmm. Whew. That's a little more negative. Mm. Yeah. And so, of course, the first question we should ask after reading all these positive ones is what's going on here? And what we see is that this city used to be called the faithful city, Mm. but it's no longer faithful. So these oaks are, again, this picture of right worship, right relationship Mm -hmm. with God who provides. Here, these oaks that they're taking pride in are symbols of not true worship anymore because they've become unfaithful. And the way that they've become unfaithful is unfortunately something we hear throughout the whole Testament. They're not taking care of the people that God Mm -hmm. called them to take care of the most vulnerable. Um, They're acting in unjust ways, even though they're focused on worshiping the right way. 
And so we see that disconnect there. But the end of Isaiah, Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 4, mm-hmm. kind of tells a different story. So at the beginning of Isaiah, we see that they used to be proud of these oaks. They're not going to be proud of them anymore. God kind of redefines oaks at the end of Isaiah. Elisa, will you get that for us? Yeah, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting Mm. of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins and they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. So at the beginning of Isaiah, we have this picture of them being proud of trees that are oaks. Who does God restore Mm. and make into oaks at the end of Isaiah? The oppressed. The oppressed, the captives, prisoners, Prisoners. Mm. mourners. Yeah, those who mourn. So we get this picture from ruin to repair, from devastation to deliverance. And that reminds me of one of the other characteristics of oak trees, which is interesting. They're very resilient. If lightning strikes them and they lose one of their major limbs, or even if the whole crown gets destroyed, there are times when an oak tree will actually grow a new crown and basically live for another hundred years or so. And so in the same way, that's what we see here in Isaiah is God's people, Mm, (laughs) right? Redeeming, yeah. Yeah, Mm. this redeeming nature Mm. that the oaks represent in the scriptures because this passage keeps describing how the weak and vulnerable, God takes them and he makes them strong. God's so cool. He's so kind. He uses everything. How do we kind of summarize this? Well, the story of oaks in the Bible is stories of provision. Protection. Worship. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, God is the one that oaks point to as the one who provides and protects But then he makes us his people to then be those people out in the world who provide and protect and care for others. And I think that's really the beauty of that end of Isaiah there is the fact that God makes his people oaks of righteousness, Mm -hmm. people that can be symbols of what God takes from ruin and makes it into repair, but then also how we can then do that in the world as oaks of righteousness. Lift our branches and point to him. Have you ever been walking through a forest or down a road where there's trees or something like that and noticed the different way that tree branches will point? Yes, I've always thought that was just random. Okay. In general, what are the two directions that they point? Up or down. Yeah. Sometimes out. Sometimes out. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, if a tree has limbs that are parallel to the ground or perpendicular to the tree, like at a 90 degree angle, they're going to struggle, especially if they're in a place where there's a lot of weather and like snow might sit on the limb or something like that. So typically they point up or they point down. You'll notice it kind of depends on the type of tree as to which way it points. Any guesses as to why that might matter? Which way the branches point? I'm guessing toward the sun if they're trying to get sunlight. I'm really struggling with this. Please. Just <laughs> as somebody that doesn't know anything about trees. Well, if they point down, like in Colorado, if we get a spring snowstorm and the mm. snow is really heavy because it has so much moisture oh, in it, it, it'll break branches. So sometimes it's good, like you were saying, but sometimes it's good if the branches actually point down. Like evergreen trees, mm-hmm. because do evergreen trees lose their leaves uh, in no. the winter? No. Right. And so if they have those leaves, they catch snow easier. Mm-hmm. So what's really cool about evergreens is their limbs will go down with the weight of the mm-hmm. snow onto other limbs, mm. which hold on to other limbs. And so they're actually the tree supporting itself. It's super cool when you watch there. it melt because the boughs will just like boing, yeah, bounce boing. up once the snow falls off. <laughs> yeah. I wish our listeners could have seen the gestures <laughs> that Elisa just did. Yeah, that's right. We need a video of that for a Facebook no, we don't. page no, or we something. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> In contrast to an evergreen, you could have something like a beech or a maple or an oak, which will have limbs that point up. And for example, a beech tree, 
its limbs will go up. And one of the reasons it does that is because when it rains, the limbs are actually funneling the water, the rainwater, down to the trunk. Mm. It helps the tree collect more water and be healthier. In fact, beech trees are kind of fun because if you ever walk through a forest with a bunch of beech trees after a rainstorm, you'll notice like streams of water going down oh, wow. the trunk, which okay. is kind of cool. <laughs> I think it's cool. Anyway, wow. you got um, a whole learning world. so much right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> you got a whole new world to explore. Now, the reason we're talking about this is because the theme, of course, is how the story of trees in the Bible tell the story of the Bible. And I think the direction of branches can be a helpful metaphor for this next aspect okay. of kind of the function of trees in the Bible. Because one of the stories they're telling is the story of worship. And we're going to see this in this passage today. So let's read uh, Genesis chapter 21, verse 33. And while somebody's turning there, maybe a question that we can kind of be holding as we're thinking about this is, which way is our worship pointing up or down Mm. as we think about some of these passages? So Genesis 21, verse 33. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Interesting. Here we have the Bible telling us that Abraham planted a tree. (laughs) So he was a conservationist. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) It was Arbor Day. Um, Yep. What's the context for uh, Genesis 21 here? Well, it's when Isaac is born. Mm -hmm. It's when Hagar and Ishmael go away and God meets with her. Mm -hmm. There's a king referenced in this passage. Who's that? Abimelech. Yep, Abimelech. And one of the reasons that Sarah and Abraham probably live close to this king is for protection, right? Because they're not with their family. They Mm. left their homeland and went somewhere else. In fact, this is one of the kings that Abraham tried the whole Sarah's just my sister trick (laughs) with with him, and that did not go well. Um, Abimelech has noticed, though, that Abraham is very blessed by God. So he wants to create a treaty with Abraham. And so he goes to him. And when Abimelech comes to Abraham and asks for a treaty, Abraham admits that some things have been happening that don't make treaties very possible. And that is the fact that Abraham has dug a well, but Abimelech's people have come and taken the well (laughs) from him. And so Abraham and Abimelech have this treaty and Abimelech promises they're not going to do things like that anymore, basically as a part of the treaty, which is why it mentions Beersheba, which means the well of seven or the well of an oath. And so that's kind of what's happening here. And then Abraham does what? He plants... A tree. A little bit about the tamarisk tree. I don't know if you know much about them. Mm -hmm. I did not before. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, what do they look like? Uh, They can grow up to maybe about 30 feet, even without much water, which is why they do really good in that climate where Abraham was. Bedouins would plant them not only for shade, but also their flocks could nibble on their branches as a source of food as well. And so we have Abraham planting this shade tree near this well. Which suggests maybe a desire for permanence, which he's not had up to this Hmm. point. Because trees, are they quick growing or slow growing? It's slow. So you won't be there for a while if you're planting a tree. That's right. So there's almost this little nod to God is going to protect and God is going to provide this space and I can put some roots down here. Literally. Which is kind of cool. Uh Yeah. (laughs) Good. (laughs) What else I think could be going on here is something that we see show up in the law later with Abraham planting this tree. So let's read Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses two through four. You must demolish completely all the places where the nations whom you are about to dispossess served their gods on the mountain heights, on the hills, and under every leafy tree. Break down their altar smash their pillars, burn their sacred poles with fire, and hew down the idols of their gods, and thus blot out their name from their places. You shall not worship the Lord your God in such ways. Yeah, and when we see burn their sacred poles in another place in Deuteronomy, it says you shall not plant any tree as a sacred pole. It doesn't say you shouldn't plant trees. It says you shouldn't plant trees with the purpose of it being a sacred pole or an object of idol worship. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, of course, way after Abraham that yeah. we're seeing these verses, right? Because this is a part of the law of Moses. But one of the, the functions that trees had throughout the story of the Bible was they would be planted in signs of worship to a god or the gods. Mm-hmm. In fact, later Israel gets in trouble in Hosea 4.13 for doing exactly what was described in Deuteronomy 12 that they shouldn't do. They sacrifice on the tops of mountains, make offerings upon the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth because their shade is good. So not only did Israel not get rid of the high places, but they're actually worshiping Mm -hmm. um, in a very similar way. 
But we have Abraham here planting this tree. And so perhaps part of what's happening here is not only is Abraham planting this sign of permanence of this kind of deposit on God's promise, but perhaps it's in worship to what does the verse say in 2133 called there on who? The name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Yeah. So perhaps Abraham is planting this tree in worship to God since the law doesn't exist yet, which it says it shouldn't do that. (laughs) Um, I think what's really cool about this, if we look a little bit later, actually just the very next verse, what does Genesis 21, 34 say? And Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines for many days. Many days. So we have this kind of like, hey, this tree might take a long time to mature. I'm going to plant this because God's with me and I'm going to be here a while. And then the next verse says, and he was there for a while. Yeah. It also makes me wonder how that tree is a sign to those around him. One, it's a sign of the treaty, right? Remember this? I'm planting this right here so Mm -hmm. your folks stay away from from my well. But also, if people would say, hey, who you're worshiping under that tree? Yeah, exactly. You know, Asherah? (laughs) Nope, nope, Yahweh. And it's a sign of a distinctive type of worship in that same physical place. That's right. Yeah, because he says, I called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Mm -hmm. That's who Abraham worships. And so... Uh, As we think about trees in general and kind of how we started this conversation, what were we talking about? Which direction the branches were going. Mm -hmm. Which direction Mm -hmm. the branches are going. Yeah. And so perhaps we can kind of think about in our own lives, what are the times when our branches are pointing upward in worship to God and what times they're pointing downward to us or to what we think is most important? How are some of the ways in our lives that sometimes we point our branches in the wrong directions Mm. by our priorities uh, about what we consider important and meaningful and uh, when those things take too big of a priority in our lives then it gives mixed signals as to who our Mm. god really is that's helpful i I think about how the weight and the burdens of the world Mm -hmm. can kind of push our branches from up to down mm-hmm. cause us to try to maybe find our own solutions. Yeah. And, and yet right. you also reference that some kinds of trees get nurture from the branches being pointed down. Mm-hmm. So, you yeah. know, as, as long as we're understanding that we're receiving, uh, mm-hmm. this whole illustration makes me think of closed and open hands as well, you know. Yeah. And so maybe for fun, as we're driving around town today, pay attention to which way the limbs are pointing and consider... Am I trusting in God or am I trusting in myself? Yeah, interesting conversation about branches in that part of our series called What's With All the Trees? And you may remember that Jesus described his followers as the branches. And so where are your branches pointing? Thought-provoking question, isn't it? Well, this episode of the Discover the Word podcast has been a bit of a nature walk amongst the trees, marveling at the intricacy and complexity and awe-inspiring aspects of this part of God's creation, and also taking note of how trees are so often used as images in the scriptures to help us understand God and ourselves and other important parts of the world. And the group will wrap up this study with a focus on fruit trees and what it is that makes for healthy good fruit-bearing trees, and in a similar way, what it is that builds a healthy and good fruit-bearing life for each of us. That comes up after this preview of what happens in our next podcast. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, doubt. What comes to mind when you hear that word? Um, Something bad. People talk about it as if it's something bad. You know, it's one of those things that I feel like it can be a really bad word in communities of faith, right? Mm -hmm. In the church. And even something that can seem like the antithesis of where we should be. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, I think many of us, if we're honest, have had doubts, right? You Mm -hmm. bet. And the thing that I've been really processing recently is how the scriptures reveal that the presence of faith does not necessarily mean the absence of all doubt. Mm -hmm. And in fact, while we often think about doubting our faith, how often do we think about doubting our doubts? I've heard the statement, many of us believe our doubts and doubt our beliefs, but we need to believe our beliefs and doubt our doubts. Exactly. And so be part of a helpful conversation as Rasul takes Bill and Elisa and Daniel on a tour through some scriptures that can help us with doubting our doubts. 
Be part of that conversation on the next Discover the Word podcast. And now the final part of this episode about what's with all the trees. Daniel? What are some of the signs of health in a tree? New growth. New growth. Yeah. Bears fruit. Yeah. What about the leaves themselves? They're strong. They're not withered and wrinkled yep. up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes you'll see burn spots on leaves mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. If trees get some kind of a blight, because mm-hmm. I think, you know, there was a time here in North America where there are gazillions of chestnut trees and then a a chestnut blight came mm-hmm. in, and now you can't hardly find a chestnut tree anymore. Or the pine beetle in Colorado and Wyoming yeah. that just took out whole forests. Yeah. This is pretty obvious, but soil and setting are pretty important for the health of a tree, especially, Rasul, with what you mentioned of bearing fruit, especially good fruit. A good example of one of the most difficult places for a tree to live would be in a city. Rasul, you mentioned (laughs) seeing trees in Philadelphia or in New York where you live now, or for anybody, if you go into just a downtown area and they've planted trees, it's really tough for trees to survive. One of the main reasons for that is because trees really like loose soil for Mm -hmm. their roots, and a city Mm -hmm. is what? Concrete. (laughs) Packed. One of the things that was discovered, and this is in the hidden... Uh, life of trees as well. By this point, you should want to read the book, I hope. Um, (laughs) But they talked about how in major cities, they were noticing that roots were penetrating pipes, like sewage pipes or water pipes or whatever. And for a long time, people thought it was because there was moisture there. Mm. But over time, what they discovered is actually around pipes is where the loosest soil still is in the city. That makes sense. And so the roots were finding that loose soil and expanding and causing problems for pipes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Other things that make it really hard for trees to survive in the city are, especially in a winter climate, there's a lot of salt, salt spray that goes on trees, Mm -hmm. which causes problems for them. The ground is so compact that water rolls away too quickly from the trunk. And so they can't really absorb that and Mm -hmm. store that water or find life from it. So it's a pretty tough life to be a tree in an urban setting, in any kind of city setting. And oftentimes we see that because trees in those settings typically have really short lifespans, especially compared to their counterparts in like a healthy forest Mm -hmm. or something like that. What's interesting is in the story of the Bible, the Bible talks a lot about soil and setting and the fruit of trees. Those Mm -hmm. are some of the themes that show up. In fact, let's read probably one of, if not the most famous example, something many people that grew up with Bible had to memorize early on. Uh, This is Psalm chapter one, verse three. What does it say there? And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and whatever he does, he prospers. Yeah. And and who's it describing? Who's the he there? It's the righteous. The righteous. Mm. Yep. Yeah. The wise person who spends time thinking about and dwelling on the wisdom of God. And notice you see kind of all three here, right? Soil setting Mm. and fruit. What kind of soil is he in? Well, it's it's by streams, streams of, water, of water, so right? it's in a it's got Rich. a good resource yep. right there. Yeah. Yep, which is part of that setting as well. Mm-hmm. And then, does he yield a little bit of fruit, or a lot of fruit, or really doesn't tell us in but season? It's and in it season. prospers. You yeah, know, so yeah, it prospers. I think that prospers. I think yeah. of a lot of fruit. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we have this tree that's prospering, and it's this picture of someone whose roots are mm-hmm. in the story of God and the wisdom of God in that relationship with Him. Proverbs kind of picks up on this a little bit in Proverbs chapter three, verse eighteen. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her; those who hold her fast are called happy or blessed. Yeah. So the she there is wisdom, lady wisdom, this picture of, again, this wisdom of God, this story of God being tied in with the Lord. And we see what's that phrase. And we talked about that early on in these conversations. What kind of tree? Tree She's a tree of life. Yeah, Tree of life. Mm -hmm. So something Mm -hmm. that brings life, Mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. Uh, Jesus also talked about fruit and trees, especially related to what a good tree produces. This is Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, 
nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And there's a similar passage that is in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45. And I think it is important to read both of these because Luke brings a little context to Mm -hmm. this. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from the bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. What you read there, I think this is the Sermon on the Plain as opposed to the Sermon on the Mount. Figs are not gathered from thorns or grapes from a bramble. Each tree will be known by its own fruit. And that reminds me of the earlier conversation where we saw the tree of life in the next life where it produces 12 different kinds of fruit. Mm -hmm. So whatever that tree is, it's radically different from the kinds of trees we're accustomed to. Yeah. And if it's a little confusing here to think, wait a second, why are we talking about grapes? Because aren't those on a vine? Well, the word for tree often in the Bible refers to like something with a woody stem or a woody branch. Mm -hmm. If you think about grapevines... They yeah. look woody, right? They, they <laughs> and do. So, they look like yeah. baby trees. Yeah. In fact, throughout the story of the Bible, the word tree often refers to something that's about knee high or taller, mm-hmm. which is helpful in some of these. And that's about as tall as a lot of trees get in the Middle East. Right. They just aren't very big. Yeah, yeah, true. Immediately after this sermon that Elisa was just reading, Jesus goes into a story about building a house on either rock or on sand. So talking about foundations and why foundations matter. But let's think a little bit about that phrase, the good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, for it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. That's an interesting connection as we're talking about trees and setting and soil, isn't it? Well, it's a metaphor for us to look at what a tree produces, well, what are we producing? You know, and and Paul talks about fruit of the spirit very clearly that those are the things that God wants to grow out of the woodiness Mm -hmm. of our (laughs) lives, right? And the whole idea that the healthiness of what's on the inside Mm -hmm. determines the healthiness of what's produced on the outside is a tremendous metaphor for us to think about. Yeah, and I think about the implications of the setting and the soil. Mm -hmm. Setting where are the places that I'm putting myself in and how Mm -hmm. might that be impacting what kind of fruit that I produce soil what am I consuming what am I Mm -hmm. taking in and you know how is that impacting by the time you get to fruit bearing season Mm -hmm. it's too late to be Mm -hmm. thinking about so good what the preparation Mm -hmm. process was Mm -hmm. yeah with the setting and soil thing with hydrangeas Mm -hmm. the color of the flower is determined by the acidity within Mm -hmm. the soil that has been planted in so you can tell by looking at its bloom where it is Yeah. If we fast forward a little bit further in the story of the Bible, James chapter 3, verse 12 kind of picks up on this theme of out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's talking about the context of taming the tongue and how difficult that is and how in one voice we can bless the Lord and Father and with the same tongue we can curse those who are made in the likeness of God. And then right there in Chapter 3, verse 12, what does it say? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Yeah, and so again, kind of building off that theme that Jesus had of out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here we see that, right? Out of this heart Mm -hmm. is a voice that is praising God in one hand, but cursing those who are made in the likeness of God. That's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, that grabs attention. So there's a sense that what's deep inside of us comes out in the fruit that we bear. And Rasul, I thought it was really important, the distinction you made of when we're starting to talk about fruit, that's too late almost (laughs) because Mm -hmm. what's going on before that really matters. Yeah, I remember I started thinking a few years ago, my devotional life starts the night before. Mm -hmm. Because I would sometimes beat myself up Mm -hmm. if it was hard for me to get out of bed or get some time with God. But I'm like, but I chose to go to bed at two. Mm -hmm. So, like, (laughs) you know, but I'm struggling. It's not about a spiritual maturity at that point. It's about just my physical body being tired. So let me try to put the things in place ahead of time so that I even give myself a position, the right setting in order to flourish. Yeah. And it reminds me, too, of what is the purpose of the fruit that we create? 
right? Oftentimes we think about it as just for us, right? Like, oh, the fruit of the spirit, I'm more patient, mm. I'm more kind, I'm uh, more gentle. Yeah. But it's but what's really the purpose to of demonstrate God's character in our world. It's really to attract other people to him. Trees don't eat their own fruit. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why John the Baptist said to the people listening to him, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Produce a fruit in your life that shows your life's been changed mm-hmm. and transformed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so as we kind of bring this whole series together, we talked about how the story of the Bible starts with trees, mm-hmm. fruit trees <laughs> that mm-hmm. are God's provision for his people, but also trees that quickly become a sign not of life, but of death, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, that tree becomes such a sign of death that if we look at Acts chapter 5, Verses 29 through 32, we see that Jesus is killed by being hung on what? A tree. Being hung on a tree. And so that eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that becoming a sign of death finds its full fulfillment in Jesus being hung on the tree of life and dying. And so here we have this tree of death. But when we look to Jesus and trust in him, we become witnesses of God. We become what Isaiah was talking about, oaks of righteousness that bear fruit. And we can bear good fruit that isn't just good for us, but also good for the world. Uh, So what's with all the trees in the Bible? Well, I think they're helping us understand the story of the Bible that not only points us to God as the one whom we depend on and find true life, but also as a reminder that Part of why we're here in this world is to bear good fruit for the benefit of others, too. A good reminder that healthy trees bear fruit, and bearing fruit is an evidence of a living and healthy faith as well. Well, you've been listening to another episode of the Discover the Word podcast alongside Lisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And Daniel has led us through this one titled, What's With All the Trees? Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Now, before we go this time, I want you to know that we are grateful to have friends like you joining us for these conversations on Discover the Word. And we're especially thankful for supportive friends who make this ministry possible through their financial giving. Discover the Word is part of Our Daily Bread Ministries, and it is our mission to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible accessible to people all around the world. You can show your support by giving online at discovertheword.org click on the Donate tab. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries. 